huge responsibility because you have programs all over the city, really. Well, we're starting. Yes, we're <laughs> Well, thank you very much for having me. So, could I just get a quick uh, understanding of who who I'm talking to? I know Renata; she's a cardiac surgeon. We have fellows and faculty in geriatrics uh, and gerontology and okay. palliative care, and dental. Okay, great. Okay. I'm, a, I'm a geriatrician. I work in the post-acute care, so I take care of Dr. Fossil's patients after when they can't go home. Right. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, great. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, actually, this is a talk I haven't given for some time. <laughs> Last time I gave it was in Pittsburgh when I was um, uh, at the Oxnard Clinic in cardiology there. But uh, So I apologize. Some of this may be dated material, but a lot of it is basic uh, uh, physiology, and I don't think a great deal has changed. Um, there may be some new things in terms of magnetic resonance imaging, but the basic concepts that I want to uh, put forth today, I hope will come through. So with that being said, we have a lot to go over and just a few background um, issues, all of which um, are things I'm sure you're familiar with, is that we have as obviously an increasing population of patients over the age of 70 years. Uh, this is uh, back in 1990 and I'm sure that if we upgrade this uh, to today it won't look much different and that is that people who are 50 and younger, uh, 30 years separated, that, that, that uh, prevalence of patients in this age group and uh, population in this age group won't be much different. But as you see, as we get in 50 and older and 65 and older, the population, the, the elderly population or the senior population is growing significantly. And we know that there's an increased incidence of cardiovascular disease in the elderly. Uh, cardiac discharges by age. Again, this is a dated data, but I know that if we updated it, it would not look very different, that the hospital discharges per 10,000 population are significantly higher in uh, the geriatric age group. And of that cardiovascular disease problem, coronary artery disease and ischemic heart disease prevails. Uh, this is data from uh, the uh, group in uh, Baltimore, uh, Jerry Licata, um, uh, back as, old, as uh, long ago as 1950, showing women in yellow and men in gray that as, the, as age progresses, that the incidence of coronary disease peaks. And actually, as men start to get into their last third deciles, uh, the incidence of coronary disease actually begins to decrease because most people who are going to die of coronary disease are going to start dying of other causes. And women have a totally different pattern because uh, until they lose the benefit of estrogen receptors, they are actually protected and then suddenly and these deciles rise up to have the same incidence of coronary disease as men. This data taken from autopsy data shows the same thing that women reach the incidence of coronary disease uh, the same as men, but later in life. And please, let's make this informal if you want to stop and ask questions, uh, please do. Is there any phenomena where, you know, the 65 year old has his cabbage and then it seems like, you know, I see a, any number of people in their 70s and 80s that are 20 years out from their is, do they change their lifestyle? Well, actually, it's a great question, and I think some of the issues that we'll get into towards the end of the talk will, will uh, uh, relate to that. Uh, and lifestyle changes, exercise, diet, weight management make a huge difference in stalling what otherwise would be the continued progression of age, aging changes. So uh, just another way of looking at the incidence or prevalence in this case of coronary disease uh, as a function of age, uh, looking at criteria by resting criteria versus exercise stress testing that you can increase the yield of, of detecting coronary disease. And this is age uh, dependent, again, with that, de that decline in the later years. This has a major impact on health care. As we can see, the number of Americans with heart disease uh, coming up to the present time uh, has increased linearly and will probably continue to increase for several decades. So that the impact on our healthcare system in both uh, 
uh, capacity uh, and dollars is immense. Well, it appears that aging does affect cardiovascular structure and function, and what I would like to do in going over aging and its impact on the CV system is to talk about a variety of things. First of all, there are investigational difficulties in differentiating the actual effects of aging versus disease itself. Uh, and that's because, as we've already seen, with coronary disease, there's a high disease incidence and prevalence, and this generates investigation into the effects of aging tough. Uh, this problem exists across multiple species, and we have the issue from those of you who are maybe epidemiologists uh, about longitudinal studies is the best way to study populations versus cross-sectional studies. The advantage of longitudinal studies is that it gives us an opportunity to look at given individuals over a lifespan of the species. There are methodological challenges in this, of course, uh, and the advantages of cross-sectional is that all ages are represented at one time. The disadvantages is that the older subjects may have been survivors and not represent aging changes. So there's been a lot of tough uh, issues for those interested in studying. I'm not an investigator in this area. This was just a review that I made, although I do have some studies that, that we've published back in the 80s that uh, relate to aging that you'll see in a moment. The other confounding issues are sedentary lifestyle and physical deconditioning that seems to be more prevalent as we grow older, relative weight increases, the use of tobacco and alcohol, whether the studies are conducted in institutional or community subjects, etc., to include the impact of other organ system problems. So as we go on, I'd like to take what I call a systems approach. I was an old engineer before I became a physician, so I'm going to give you my little engineering block diagram here, and we're going to march through most of this, although I'm not going to address uh, the venous system. I'm going to address primar primarily these uh, three areas up here, what the aging effects are on the vascular system, the heart, and the CNS system, and how they interact in a systems approach. So let's start with the vascular system. I start with the vascular system primarily to emphasize that changes in the vascular system really dictate what happens to the heart. The heart's just a, a pump that uh, generates pressure and flow, the characteristics of which are primarily determined by the peripheral circulation. So we're going to talk about uh, that first, excuse me, make sure I didn't go too far. Uh, histologically, we see a variety of changes in a variety of layer differences in the vasculature, uh, including prominent changes in the thoracic aorta. The renal arteries seem to be the least affected with age. Proximal changes, that is, closer to the heart, distal change, are early and distal changes are late but more expense, extensive. Uh, there's a decrease in the number of collagen fibers in the vascular wall, the degeneration of elastin, and these seem to be, uh, depending on the population study, independent of atherosclerosis itself. Uh, intimal and medial changes are shown in this slide, and I'll just basically review those quickly, uh, or have you review those quickly. Uh, the fact is that multiple changes with age, independent of atherosclerosis, uh, appear to occur. On gross morphological changes, there are increases in the diameter in the large arteries, increase in the stiffness of these vessels, and these increases in stiffness depend on where you are in the vascular tree. So uh, from um, actually a textbook that I participated in, this is a chapter that I participated in with Carl Papine and Dick Connie uh, from Florida, Michael O'Rourke, this is not our O'Rourke, but Michael O'Rourke, and, uh, uh, Violo from Sydney, Australia, and Wilma Nichols uh, now with Gainesville, uh, Gainesville with uh, Carl and, and Dick uh, in a textbook that we did called Ventricular Vascular Coupling, uh, focusing on how the heart interacts with the periphery. Uh, this is one of the slides that we show that this is the radius, okay, uh, of a vessel uh, in the ascending aorta. Uh, so most of us have uh, a diameter twice this of two to three centimeters. Most of our aortas are like this, okay? And with age, uh, this diameter increases in a statistically significant manner. Uh, and then when one w looks at the ratio of the thickness of the wall of the aorta to its diameter, 
2R. That's the ratio of a wall, maybe a centimeter thick, to a diameter of uh, the aorta, which I just said was maybe, I'm sorry, not a centimeter thick, millimeters thick, uh, versus, uh, I was thinking of the left ventricle, but in the aorta, uh, you know, millimeters thick versus uh, centimeters uh, wide, uh, you see that old people or old subjects versus young subjects that there's a marked difference in this ratio of wall thickness to the diameter of the vessel. And this is kind of an indirect index of stiffness. Uh, the, the modulus of elasticity is a word that mechanical and material science engineers use for stiffness. And if you look at that modulus of elasticity from pressure strain work in uh, the laboratory as a function of age, uh, that stiffness of the aorta goes up in a linear fashion. So this causes increased wall tension and overall stiffness so that the pressure or tension length, the pressure volume or tension length relationships of the ascending and thoracic aorta, which uh, as you can see the ascending aorta is, uh, has a different uh, pressure or tension length relationship than the thoracic aorta, but particularly with age, these relationships change significantly. So to the left is stiffer, okay? That means a small change in length leads to a large rise in tension in the wall, okay? So that you tolerate changes in length much better at a younger age or in the thoracic aorta than you do in the ascending aorta. <laughs> this leads to what? Uh, something that all of you in geriatrics ought to be very familiar with, and that's pulse wave velocity. How fast a pressure wave travels down the vessel, down the aorta, from the aortic valve to the periphery. That's not how fast blood is propagated or a red cell is propagated. That's how fast a pressure wave is propagated. It's kind of like throwing a stone in a circular swimming pool. You throw it in the middle, it generates waves which propagate out to the walls. That doesn't mean the molecules of water are moving to the walls. It's a disturbance. Just like my voice goes from my mouth to your ear, I am propagating disturbances in the air. So too do you propagate a pressure wave from the aorta all the way to the periphery that travels at a very defined speed. In most adults, it's usually about six to eight meters per second or 600 to 800 centimeters per second. That increases both with location in a normal individual and increases with age as shown from primarily the work of Michael O'Rourke. Pulse wave velocity, I already mentioned, five to 600 centimeters a second in the young and as we get older, that pulse wave velocity increases. So if you were able to put your fingers on the carotid and put your fingers on the femoral and your brain was good enough to detect the time difference between the pulse, uh, which it probably isn't, you would see a difference between young and old. But certainly measurement techniques show that very easily. And stiffness, as I mentioned, is also not only a function of age, but a function of where you are in the aorta. So here in the ascending aorta, stiffness is measured in dynes per centimeter squared versus the iliacs goes up as we get into the tapered, tapering of the vessel from the ascending aorta through the diaphragm to the renal arteries to the iliacs. And pulse wave velocity parallels stiffness uh, in a very nice way so that pulse wave velocity, pretty easy to measure in a clinical investigational environment is a, has been used by many people, particularly in the hypertension literature even today, uh, in fact extensively today, as an index of aortic stiffness. And looking at interventions, pharmacologic, particularly in, uh, pharmacologic interventions in the hypertension field, this is used all the time. So we've been through these ch functional changes. This, we also know that there's an increase in peripheral vascular resistance from about 1,000 dyne centimeters per minus fifth all the way up into the 1,500 with age. So the results are changes in arterial dynamics. Okay? These stiffness changes, these histological changes, these morphologic changes, these gross changes, and the functional changes in the aorta lead to increases in systolic and pulse pressure. 
And as you can see, this is actually is from an article of mine, some back in the 80s, uh, extracted uh, to this uh, particular chapter that we wrote. In the ascending aorta, these are done with micromanometer pressure transducers. These are high fidelity pressure tracings. They're not fluid felt tracers, so they're really true. Okay, they're absent any artifact. This is in the ascending aorta. You see a little late systolic rise in a typical adult. We'll talk about that a little more. And as you move through the arch into the descending thoracic at the uh, level of the diaphragm down below the renal arteries and into the iliacs, you see a significant change in the pulse pressure in both in personality and in amplitude in all people. But those changes are, as shown in this slide, um, looking at the increase in systolic and the change in diastolic pressure, the increase in pulse pressure as a function of age. So we're being hammered, if you will, internally by our own pulse pressure in a much more significant way as we age than when we were younger as the vessels become stiffer. This leads to an increased amplitude of and earlier arrival of what we call wave reflections. So I talked about wave propagation going down from the aorta to the iliacs, they bounce back. There are reflections just like in that swimming pool that I mentioned, and those reflections come back to the valve and to the heart quickly enough at six to seven to 800 centimeters per second going forward and the same going backwards. They arrive back while systole is still occurring. That's how fast wave propagations can go. So before the heart ha has even completed its contraction, a wave is generated, propagated, moves down to the periphery, and part of it goes forward and part of it comes back. Again, this is not blood, this is a propagation of wave. And it arrives in such a way that it changes the personality of the wave in the ascendant aorta in a young subject versus an older subject, or you can even manipulate this with nitroglycerin and make this elderly subject look like a young subject by changing the characteristics of the aorta with nitroglycerin and distending blood pressure. So a late systolic wave appearing in the middle of systole is a function of stiffening of the aorta and is characteristic of older people versus younger people. This has incredible clinical significance. As we move on into, this, into the talk, we'll talk about this more, but this change in the waveforms is a function of those changes in anatomy and physiology. Uh, we actually first described this in San Antonio when I was on active duty at Brook Army Medical Center. Uh, we observe these differences in a very, very consistent way between young individuals and older individuals. Yes, even at BAMC we studied older individuals because we have the retired population uh, there as well as the young troopers. And so I, I was head of the cath lab in those years and had an opportunity to classify uh, this was published in circulation in 1980, what we call type A versus type C beats. This, is, this paper, I'm proud to say, is still referred to in the literature uh, every week, particularly in the hypertension literature, uh, where the differentiation of these kinds of waveforms with non-invasive techniques in radiotonometry has become very popular in treating patients uh, with antihypertensive medications. So, uh, we call this little inflection point uh, P sub I, if you will. Uh, we, we say that the time it takes, uh, we assume that this inflection point is the arrival time of the reflected wave, so it took this many milliseconds to go down the aorta and arrive back. Uh, we have the same uh, slower time in a younger individual shown here. And if we measure the total pulse pressure in the elderly individuals, 57 millimeters of mercury versus 31 millimeters of mercury in the younger individual, and the augmented pressure, we call this the augmented pressure, kind of like having a built-in intra-aortic balloon pump, mistimed, if you will, instead of diastole, it's timed into systole. That's 17 millimeters of mercury versus minus six in the younger individual. 
we take the change in pulse pressure, the delta P, 17, that is, the change in pulse pressure in late system divided by the total pressure, and we have something called 29 and minus 19, and that's called the augmentation index. Any of you read the literature, in, particularly again in the hypertension literature, this augmentation index is used immensely in studying patients and their response to investigational drugs. And uh, we were, in fact, the first to describe this in um, San Antonio some 20 some odd years ago. Um, so that's a little bit about alterations in pressure and flow waveforms. There's also decreased amplification of the pulse pressure as we get older because of the stiffness of the vessels. In young people, the pulse does get amplified as it gets down into the femoral arteries. Uh, that amplification decreases as a function of age. Alteration in aortic input and in impedance spectra, I'm not going to bore you with something this uh, area dite, but there is something besides peripheral resistance that one measures when one looks at the resistance to left ventricular ejection. We all think about in the coronary care unit and the ICUs peripheral vascular resistance, but there's something more, more um, sophisticated called impedance that has to do with the pulsatile nature of the circulatory system plus the elastic nature of the aorta and the storage characteristics of capacitor, if you will, and the inertia of blood flow. So the heart has to take a stroke volume that's initially at rest give it inertia, eject it into the aorta, overcome the elastic properties of the aorta, and then the valve closes and the aorta takes over and moves on into the periphery. The heart is actually protected from the periphery in a significant way by the, the large vessels, and to the degree that it's protected is to the degree that those large vessels are healthy versus stiff. So there is something called characteristic impedance. I won't bore you with how that's calculated and we see in general that characteristic impedance of the aorta, very different than peripheral resistance, rises with age. Uh, this is another paper that we published in circulation uh, 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 describing the difference in the impedance spectra. Uh, one has to do very uh, um, uh, detailed Fourier breakdown of pressure and flow waveforms in put it into a cube, break it down into its very, various harmonics and calculate impedance spectra. Again, I'm not going to bore you or think that you're going to understand these unless you are uh, a student of this business, but the spectra are very different in type A beats or older individual versus type C or younger individuals, showing that there's a much more oscillatory characteristic to the impedance spectra. If any of you are familiar with organ pipe theory, uh, this is all about reflections. So we have a lot more increase in reflections in elderly individuals. This leads to a mismatch between left ventricular ejection and impedance um, and an increase in the systolic pressure time index. I'm gonna come back to this slide. What that means is that during systole, the heart is seeing a greater afterload, to put it in simple terms, because of this late rise in pressure versus the absence or the arrival of that the arrival of that reflection later in diastole as opposed to early in systole means that we have a mismatch and that causes greater myocardial oxygen demands and greater left ventricular work. So a summary of the changes in human large vessel structure and function are here. Uh, we just, I did not talk about beta adrenergically mediated uh, systemic arterial vasodilatation, but most of this we covered. So that's the vascular system. If we go and move away in our systems approach from the vascular system to the heart, similarly, uh, there are histologic changes in the heart. Uh, uh, the only consistent degenerative changes are, sh are those shown here. Myocardial cell size increases with age. There's increased in the cardiac skeletal fibrosis. Uh, no evidence of increase in myocardium itself. There's calcification of the aortic and mitral annulus that we see on echocardiography all the time in the clinical situation, varying immensely from patient to patient. But as one gets into the 80s and 90s, you will almost always see calcium on the echo. So here is uh, cell diameter versus age to show some uh, change in myocardial cell versus aging. Uh, gross morphologic changes uh, really uh, 
uh, most recent autopsy data from the Baltimore uh, 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 longitudinal study suggest increased heart weight for women. Um, uh, and we do know that there is an increase in left ventricular mass uh, from Gary Gerstenbler's studies. Uh, this is one of his studies showing left ventricular wall thickness as a function of age increasing. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, functionally, uh, there's no real impairment in peak force development of cells that are aged. There's an intact Frank Starling relationship, and the inotropic response to increased calcium impaired electrical stimulation is unchanged. Thus, aged myocardial cells do not show a great deal of intrinsic deficit in terms of being able to generate force. Uh, however, much like hypertrophy in those patients studied with left ventricular hypertrophy, there is an increase to the time to develop that peak force. So myocardial cells are capable of generating tension and generating peak force, just like young, older cells are able to do that, just like younger cells, but they take a little longer to get there. And the most striking changes in aged myocardial cells have to do with delayed relaxation. So actin myosin filaments engage forces developed, and then as calcium flux changes and the actin myosin filaments have to disengage so that the cell can relax and stretch, that process it seems to be altered much more significantly than contraction. There are electrophysiologic changes in the conduction system, increased elastic and collagen tissue fat accumulation around the sinus node. There's about 90% loss of pacemaker cells uh, by the age of 75. Uh, in the more clinical arena of electrocardiography in the electrophysiology lab, there's mild increase in PR interval, uh, mild increase in QT intervals on the electrocardiogram, a little left with axis shift of the QRS in minor ST and T wave changes. Holter findings in patients uh, in this age group show supraventricular beats about 100 per 24 hours and 26 percent, et cetera. I'll show some slides that are a little more graphic. Uncommon in the absence of disease uh, is sinus bradycardia, long pauses, high degree AV block, and fib flutter. Fib flutter become more a function of hypertension and other uh, identifiable diseases. If we put patients on a treadmill, uh, there's a significant difference in supraventricular beats generated in the ages 80 to 90, and similarly in ventricular ectopic beats generated on a treadmill, uh, Jerome Flegg uh, from the Baltimore Longitudinal Study. Um, Exercised induced nonspecific ventricular tachycardia, significant difference of uh, uh, tachycardia. Still low percentages, but much different in the age uh, group than in the young group. And that brings me then to this part of our systems diagram, the central nervous system. Three important observations. Uh, Catecholamine content of the myocardium decreases, uh, sort of suggesting a presynaptic deficit in catecholamine metabolism uh, by sympathetic nerves. Uh, baroreceptor sensitivity decreases, is decreased, uh, further lowered with elevated blood pressure, uh, which occurs commonly in the aged. So our, our uh, hairy nerve and our, our ninth nerve uh, uh, activity decreases. Changes in the central nervous system uh, for example, decreases in the arrhythmia uh, reflex. We see very little in sinus arrhythmia in adults compared to young people and see significant sinus arrhythmia in young adults, commonly on the electric cardiogram. So um, I have until 1.15 with some time for questions and answers. Let me see if I can time the rest of this. Uh, so that's a, a quick review of what happens to the vessels what happens to the heart, what happens a little bit to the central nervous system in a superficial way. A lot happens in the venous system with losses of um, um, uh, tone in the venous, uh, large veins in the legs, losses of valve competency, uh, postural changes. I do, I do not have a review of that, but this is also very important in terms of preload effects on the heart. Um, so we go to clinical data. We've talked about blood pressure already. Uh, 
Cardiac output, left ventricle of chamber volumes, ejection fraction, and actual circumferential fiber shortening, which is one way of saying contractility, these change little with age. What does change, as implied by my statement about the relaxation of the myocardial fibers, is diastolic function. And that's the major thing that changes with aging in patients, again, in the absence of identifiable common diseases. Reduced early diastolic filling rates are shown by multiple non-invasive clinical t uh, tests, echocardiography, Doppler, radionuclear angiography. Uh, this is one example of expressed in end diastolic volumes per second, therefore to normalize patients as a function of age. I'm sorry the years didn't show here. But this technique, and this can be done by nuclear or frame-by-frame -frame echocardiography, this is a nuclear study, shows that in diastole, the ability to fill the ventricle slows down as we get older. And we become very much more dependent on atrial contribution. So here, for example, is left ventricular filling during atrial systole, the end of diastole when you get the A-kick just before contraction, which would be the A-wave on your E to A on your echocardiogram, that when you are young, the percent of filling during atrial systole is usually between 10 and 20%. And as we get older, we become much more dependent on atrial systole. So loss of the atrial kick, such as with atrial fibrillation, can be much more symptomatic and much more profound on hemodynamics uh, as we grow older. So mostly, and again, in a healthy, quote unquote, elderly individual, we will have uh, more brisk pulses because of the stiffness of the large vessels. We may hear an atrial gallop, uh, and an atrial gallop is an S4, just pre-S1, that doesn't necessarily indicate hypertrophy or disease. A single S2 in expiration, uh, and a fair percentage of patients over 60 years, uh, and because uh, the, the second heart sound, aortic and pulmonic components, become closer and closer as the aorta gets stiffer. And there's a basal systolic ejection murmur that's very common uh, in patients without any necessarily implying any valvular disease. Um, as we move towards the end of the talk, I think the, some of the more important observations of what happens with stress, after all its effort and exercise that affects our patients, their ability to do daily living, to walk up a flight of stairs, to walk from the parking lot to your clinic exam room. Uh, multiple changes occur with stress. One of the ones that have been most studied, and I'll just go over it very briefly, is maximum oxygen uptake. Um, all of you uh, may know that cardiac output by uh, the FIC principle is directly related to the amount of oxygen we uptake uh, in our lungs as we breathe in and how much the arterial venous oxygen difference occurs uh, between arterial and venous blood, how much oxygen is extracted by the periphery, particularly the large muscle mass. Okay, so as you're, as you're um, for example, as you exercise, there is a change, oxygen uptake goes up and AVO2 difference goes up oxygen uptake hopefully goes up more than AVO2 different, difference goes up to augment or generate a change in cardiac output. If you just change this equation and bring oxygen uptake over here and cardiac output over here, it's cardiac output or just multiply cardiac output times AVO2 difference, you end up that oxygen uptake is proportional to cardiac output and AVO2 difference max. AVO2 difference max in the skeletal muscle tends to become linear or, or tums, tends to become stable after um, a short while into exercise. It reaches a peak and stays as a constant. So maximum oxygen uptake is almost after you get beyond submaximal exercise, a direct index of cardiac output. So we can measure this and with mass spectrometry techniques, it's very easy to measure this now in the lab. Uh, we have it at University Hospital. I think they have it here at the VA Hospital, but I'm not sure. I have at Christus San Rosa Hospital, 
uh, uh, unit that I use for our transplant patients all the time. And levels of maximum oxygen uptake are utilized to judge fitness in competitive athletes on the high side and patients with end-stage heart failure on the low side. And we have little cutoff points or thresholds where we would consider a patient a candidate for transplantation, for example, or not. If they can get on a treadmill and reach a maximum oxygen uptake of 12 to 14 milliliters per kilogram per minute, then we usually won't transplant them until they get lower. Now that's just one number and you have to take in a whole bunch of other things, but that's sort of the general rule of thumb in the literature. And it is therefore an indicator of cardiovascular fitness. And as we look at that, there have been numerous studies revealing a decline of about 1% to year over the 50 years between our young 25 uh, to 75. It parallels a decline in work capacity, uh, and it may, if, when it's normalized for creatinine and curing, the Baltimore longitudinal study implies that the decline mainly be due to decrease in muscle mass. So this gets back to your question earlier. If you avoid a decrease in muscle mass by appropriate exercise programs and keep from uh, atrophy by becoming sedentary, you may uh, negate uh, these changes to some extent and it gets to the lifestyle changes. Exercise, weight smoking, markedly attenuates, um, that is the cessation of smoking, the, cessation, the, the onset of exercise and the reduction of weight will attenuate this otherwise age-related uh, decline. Exercise physiology, you put somebody on a treadmill and we have this common nomogram. Uh, this is from Hearst textbook that we use in, uh, we use in uh, the exercise labs everywhere. Uh, and as we see, uh, if you're in the 25 to 34 age range, we have uh, between one third maximum, two third maximum, and this would be maximum effort a rise in heart rate and a rise in blood pressure that as we get older that rise starts to become attenuated in heart rate so that maximum effort at the in this decile it, you just can't reach what you did when you were 24 25 34 both in, in, as in heart rate particularly blood pressure tends to go up uh, nevertheless as we get older and uh, that our recoveries are, are, are as shown here. But the main point from the aging standpoint is the middle here, that heart rate, maximum heart rate goes down, blood pressure goes up. Left ventricular ejection dynamics, uh, there's, um, uh, as I just showed, there's a confirmed 30% decline in heart rate, a milder decline in cardiac output, compensatory rise in stroke volume. So end diastolic volume, becomes a little higher, as we'll see in the graph, despite a, despite a small decrease in, in systolic volume, and it results in a smaller rise in exercise ejection fraction. Thus, we rely on the frank systolic mechanism more and more as we grow older. This is shown pictorially or graphically. Here, the yellow bars are the older group between 65 and 80. The younger are age 25 to 44. End systolic volume doesn't change much as cardiac output increases with exercise. There's a slightly less decrease in the older people, but the marked difference is that end diastolic volume does go up. This is the, stalling, the, the dependency on frank stalling mechanism to offset the decrease in heart rate changes that occur in older people. So because we don't increase our heart rate as much, we depend more on a stalling mechanism as we get older. Stroke volume is shown also going up with age uh, as far yellow versus gray as a function of an increase in the cardiac output. And that's just a summary. Ejection fraction is preserved as we get older. And here's just another way of showing the relationship of stroke volume to end diastolic volume that we are much more dependent on the stalling effect as we get older. That's our compensatory mechanism. Um, interesting issues with beta adrenergic responses. Exercise responses in older people re it seem like they've been beta blocked. Okay? Uh, that is, cardiac output is maintained with a lower heart rate. 
and we have these higher end diastolic volumes and systolic volumes and stroke volume. This occurs in the presence of higher catecholamine levels even. Uh, thus, there's a deficit because we would expect that we would have a uh, higher beta response to higher catecholamine mean levels, but there's a deficit in the beta adrenergic response by the heart rate response we showed earlier, by the heart rate response to isoproteranol, and by the contractile response in experimental animals. I'm going to skip over these for the sake of time. This shows some of the differences between uh, age groups, uh, young, middle-aged, and older in yellow, and exercise and post-exercise norepinephrine levels demonstrating some of the um, uh, biochemical and hormonal differences as a function of age. Postural effects are very important. Uh, our extracellular volume does decline with age and there are multiple changes in vascular tone, particularly on the venous system, which I mentioned briefly. Uh, diminished reactivity, autonomic nervous system function is altered. Um, our circulatory neurohormones diminish and our compliance that we talked about before uh, may affect the baroreceptor reflexes in attenuating the response uh, that are normally compensatory. So reflex vasoconstriction as we stand, for example, is impaired. Cardioacceleratory responses are impaired. Uh, baroreflex withdrawal due to elevated pressure favors vasorelaxation. Less able to counter the effects of change in pressure, especially when associated with sodium ingestion. Uh, but there is no age difference in optimal conditions, but modest sodium depletion results in postural hypotension and the elderly as opposed to the young. Meal consumption, another major problem at times, particularly in our geriatric population, just like postural changes may be important to you as you're evaluating your patients. Uh, there's a drop in systemic pressure compared to the young probably because of an inadequate compensation for the vasodilatation that occurs in the splanctic bed. This may predispose to presyncopal or syncopal or even myocardial ischemia if one has coexisting coronary disease. And its magnitude is directly related to the basal pressure that one has. Uh, so as you get higher blood pressures and hypertension, the response is diminished. So in summary uh, of the vascular changes, we have stiffening of the arteries, an increase in arterial systolic and pulse pressure, increase in pulse wave velocity, which leads to early reflections, early late peaking pressure, increase in impedance and LV uh, loading, increased wall stress. This is the mismatch that occurs, increase in root size and aortic wall thickness. And the myocardial changes we have as a result of those vascular changes and as a result of intrinsic myocardial changes, increased wall tension, LV hypertrophy, prolonged contraction, increased left atrial size, uh, preserved in diastolic volume, uh, hypertrophy normalizes wall stress, preserves end systolic volume and ejection fraction, uh, et cetera. And as I emphasized a little earlier, one of the more important things is what happens to diastole and relaxation. So it's important for us to understand that there's a substrate upon which all the other diseases that we haven't talked about today are superimposed. So when you're making a judgment about the impact of hypertensive heart disease or the impact of peripheral vascular disease or the impact of coronary disease, you need to remember that the substrate upon which that occurs is a function of age itself. Thanks. So any questions, please? Oh, thank you. Um, regarding the, vas the resistant vessels, you have vasodilation and vasodilation. Because from what I understand, you said the barrel barrel flex is kind of increased, decreased because you have vasodilation. But I would think that with metabolic syndrome and everything else, you would have more vasoconstriction, decreased nitric oxide. Uh, not, I'm not sure exactly how to answer your question. Uh, it, what I understand from my review here is that as our vessel, as our arterial vessels get stiffer and as our mean aortic pressure rises, that some of the baroreceptors that we primarily depend on, such as in the carotid bulb, uh, old uh, ninth nerve uh, 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 midbrain 
uh, feedback control systems that those become they, they become modulated in a downward fashion or down regulated if you will so that we don't change our arterial tone the signals that are sent to the periphery to change arterial tone are blunted number one just by the changes that occur in some of not just this receptor uh, this control uh, system but other control systems because of the changes in the vascular tree and then there are local uh, changes in the system itself particularly on the venous side um, uh, which combined with arterial changes I think uh, uh, can make uh, postural hypotension syncope presyncope a problem uh, I don't know if I answered your question, and I'm not sure about nitric oxide and endothelial function in this regard, but we know that endothelial function becomes significantly affected uh, with vessel stiffness from atherosclerosis. It's possible that it becomes affected, and it's possible that there have been more recent studies just by changes in stiffness from aging. Mm -hmm. yeah. What I was wondering is that if uh, what we observe in our patients, is that because of disease or it's aging? Well, I, I don't know. Sorry. On an individual basis, it may be very difficult to differentiate that. But I'm sure that if you're looking, for example, at plethysmographic changes in the forearm, forearm as a function of different interventions and challenges as a measure of vasoreactivity, that that obviously goes down with smoking maybe even in the absence of atherosclerosis. It and that's an endothelial function issue. It obviously goes down in the presence of vascular disease, and I'd, it probably goes down in, as a function of aging, upon which the disease changes may be even more augmented. But I don't know to the extent uh, that you have a threshold of change that differentiates between just aging and disease. As you see, most of these epidemiologic studies with large scattergrams, the, mainly the, the mean is statistically changing, but there's large uh, variations in, in, um, as one ages. So, I mean, I, I didn't give you as clinical talk as you may have been interested in. I gave you more of a physiologic presentation, but I think an understanding of the physiology of aging is important when we go into the clinic and and we deal with some of these issues. Echocardiography is striking in older patients and what happens with their, you know, we measure routinely in the echo lab wall thickness. We measure the inflow waveforms from left atrium into left ventricle in early diastole and late diastole, the E wave and the A wave. Those ratios change predictably with age. Okay, uh, if you have an E to A ratio that's normal in an 80-year-old, you suspect that it's been pseudo-normalized by, uh, by factors of both abnormal relaxation and abnormal passive filling or stiffness of the heart. So all of those uh, things become striking as you look at them in the age. And I have to emphasize to my fellows time and time again, you know, you don't say diastolic dysfunction simply because the E to A ratio is 0.9 which is less than one in an 80-year-old. That's wonderful in an 80-year-old compared to a 20-year-old where it would be 1.4 or even 2.0, the EDA ratio. Uh, there are mo other more sophisticated diastology indices in the echo lab, but echo can get pretty significant, uh, uh, sophisticated in looking at diastolic functions. But if you remember that half of the patients that show up in the emergency room with acute congestive heart failure have preserved left ventricular systolic function and are there because their diastolic function is problematic, you realize how important it is to understand changes in diastolic function, which is the most impressive thing that occurs as a function of aging, again, in the absence of these. You add hypertension, which is as common as bread and butter, then you've got, uh, you've got a very confusing you know, issue there. So, but on top of it, it becomes significant. God, somebody. So is it uh, under autonomic control? Influenced by that, can you convert from one phase waveform? Uh, we, we, you, you can convert from one phase uh, waveform to another by a variety of maneuvers. Okay, 
uh, that affect primarily large vessel compliance. So if I drop your mean distending aortic pressure with a maneuver, um, even from lying down to standing and venous pooling and you get decreased venous return, cardiac and systolic pressure drops, then the mean pressure in the aorta is what distends the aorta as that aorta is less distended and becomes less tight, more loose, that'll affect wave propagation velocities and therefore affect the timing of the reflected wave. So just simply giving somebody nitroglycerin makes a huge, you can go from a type A to a type CB just like that. A Valsalva maneuver, and we published that two years later in 82, uh, um, and some rather interesting work uh, using this Fourier transform and looking actually at the calculation of impedance, we can simulate a reflection-less system, which is an infinitely long tube without any break branch points. Because the aorta tapers and because it has branch points at the renal arteries and the iliacs, the major reflection site appears to be between the renal arteries and the iliacs. Okay, so if you get iliac stenosis, it just that augmentation index goes up like mad. But even in a normal individual uh, in the lab, and again we published this, if you take your fingers and just uh, do ephemeral artery compression on both sides. That was the job of two fellows in an experiment. That goes up instantaneously. You can see on a high fidelity aortic waveform, the late systolic pressure doubles as soon as they put their fingers down. Similar to blowing a balloon up in a descending thoracic aorta in, a vet, in an animal experiment. You can change that late systolic configuration immensely. So, and going back to whether we can modulate it with changes in uh, adrenergic tone, or, or uh, I'm sure that we can as long as we're changing those vascular um, uh, physical properties. Yeah, the reason I'm asking that is that uh, in Lewy body dementia, it, it appears that the heart is sympathetically denervated, and uh, you know, there's some reason to think that Lewy body and Alzheimer's may be actually be infectious, but in case of Lewy body disease, it would be climbing up the vagus from the heart into the brain. And the first place in the brain that has Lewy body disease is the, the motor nucleus of the 10th cranial nerve, and then it propagates retrogradely up into the brain. From Interesting. There. So clinically, and even with brain imaging, it's hard to distinguish Alzheimer's from Lewy body disease. But uh, actually, cardiac spect imaging of uh, sympathetic innervation is almost 100% accurate in distinguishing Alzheimer's from Lewy body, but it's really expensive. And so what I'm wondering is, since they have this autonomic dysfunction, their vagus nerve is chewed up, uh, whether this non-invasive waveform might be able to distinguish Alzheimer's from Lewy body. Boy, it that's an interesting hypothesis. <laughs> um, you know, these non-invasive tonometry uh, things that have a transform and uh, function that converts a peripheral radial artery waveform into a central aortic waveform is a hot subject in the area of hypertension. But when you again look at it on a population basis, the scatter is wide. Mm -hmm. And so you might hypothesize that there are some changes that you could see on a population basis, but on an individual basis, the specificity and sensitivity would probably be significantly down. Yeah. All right, thanks again for having me over. Thanks Appreciate so it. Nice to meet you finally, Renato. <laughs> Do I get CME for this?